Right, welcome everyone. Welcome to um, this evening's Hackney Society talk on the Lee Valley Regional Park. I'm Ray Blackburn. I'm one of the trustees of the society. And I help put together an events program each year. For anybody out there who doesn't know what the Hackney Society does, very briefly, um, we're a group who aim to, um, to defend and protect the historic built environment and to encourage the best quality design in any new additions to it. And uh, in, a, in a typical year, we have a program of physical uh, events, walks, talks and visits. This being a, a not a typical time, we are, um, have a trial series of online events where we're doing uh, virtual walks and talks. And tonight is one of those. The next one is due on the 4th of March. This is Mark Gorman's talk entitled Down with the Fences, which is uh, about popular resistance to the loss of green spaces in Hackney and East London in Victorian times. We'll give you more details about that later on. Now, the main event tonight is Laurie Elks talking about the Lee Valley Regional Park. It's a journey through the park. He'll tell you about that. Um, Laurie is um, a longtime resident of Hackney. He's a trustee of the Hackney Society and of the Hackney Historic Buildings Trust. And uh, since the 1970s, he's campaigned for the preservation of the Lee Valley Park. The talk will be in two halves. Uh, Laurie will talk about for about 40 minutes or so. And then we'll break for questions. You can ask us questions using the YouTube chat facility on the right hand side of your screen. But remember, you need to be logged on with a Google account into YouTube to use that facility. Uh, then the second half, and then hopefully we'll have uh, time for some more questions at the end um, before we um, wrap up uh, round about half past eight. So now I'm going to hand over to Laurie to talk us through the Lee Valley Regional Park. Over to you, Laurie. Hi. Um, I'm up here in my attic. We're going live. I've got far too many slides, and we'll see how we go going through those. I'll, uh, there won't be much linger time to look at the slides, but they will be available if you want to watch the show again on YouTube later. Uh, as we've got the wonderful nick and charge of the IT, nothing can possibly go wrong in that dimension. So uh, off we go. And you're not going to see me uh, very much from now on because I'm going to put up my first slide. Uh, it's billed as a Lee Valley Park, a two-dimensional tour, a journey through time and a journey through space. So um, my first slide... Sorry, that's my second slide. My first slide uh, is an illustration uh, of Isaac Walton's book, The Complete Angler. Angler. Uh, Isaac Walton was a businessman who lived in Clark and well on the fringe of the city, and he regularly walked to Tottenham to fish in the clean rivers, clean waters of the River Lee. The River Lee is a convergence of six chalk streams all running off the Chilton Escarpment with lovely clean fresh water, which is also a source of drinking water uh, for London and indeed still is. Which button should I be pressing? I'll do that one. There we go. Um, there were numerous mills along the, uh, that flow of water provides a lot of energy. There were numerous mills along the, the way. And these are the corn mills at Lee Bridge, situated roughly where the Middlesex filter beds now are. 19th century, uh, most of the Lee Valley remained open country, but obviously the population of London was increasing and the railways came from the 1840s and 1850s. And the Lee Valley, along with Epping Forest, became a pleasure ground for Londoners. Here we are, the Rye House Pleasure Gardens, archery, boating, bowls, cricket, one and six day return from Liverpool Street and St Pancras. There were pleasure gardens at Broxbourne as well. It was a place where you could flirt and make mischief, lots of pubs and tea houses and generally have a good time. And then by the 1960s, 70s or 80s, when I took this slide, 
and I can see my old bicycle in the foreground. This is what a lot of it looked like. This picture is taken between Bow and Stratford. It was a complete, horrible, neglected mess. So, 1944, the Greater London Plan. The politicians had made a terrible hash of making a land fit for heroes at the end of the First World War, and they were determined to do better after the Second World War by ordinary people. And the Greater London Plan was a plan to make London a better, cleaner area space for London. The main uh, architect, author, Patrick Abercrombie, a hero and villain rolled into one. He certainly looked as if he had confidence in his own powers, the power of planners, and he did. And the Abercrombie plan was a hugely interventionist document which planned to reshape London. Here's Abercrombie with a king and queen. I'm pretty sure that's Ernest Bevan between them. And they're looking at a, uh, a model of the future London. You can see Big Ben on the left. And the king seems to be particularly interested in the Savoy Hotel, judging by where they're looking in that picture. Abercrombie was keen on confining the city. He said the green belt should be the final barrier a fortified urban fence into which the town should not be allowed to extend. So London would stop there. Any future growth would leapfrog the, the, leap, the green belt. And he was responsible for new towns such as Harlow and Stevenage and Basildon, which were built further out. This map shows um, land which had already been acquired under the Green Belt Act or in the process of being acquired. And the yellow areas many of which are around the Lee Valley and Epping Forest, were land, he said, should be brought into public ownership as part of the Green Belt. He also, let me go back to the last one, he also uh, picked up on the fact that the River Lee was, you can see the, the chain of blue there, was a narrow wedge of open space which went all the way from the green belt to the squalid east end of London. And he was keen on this. A series of great reservoirs threads up the valley, extending from Walthamstow to Enfield. And they're man-made, they're acquiring a charm of their own as trees grow around them. And on their little islands, they're becoming nature reserves for large numbers of birds and the resort of privileged fishermen. Here's a good bit. These areas are great open air lung to the crowded east end. Their preservation is essential. Every piece of open land should be welded into a great regional reservation. No open land, whatever its present use, should be built on. High ambition. Nothing happened about that. The Green Belt uh, was incorporated in the Town and Country Planning Act in 1947 and in guidance in the 50s, but nothing happened about the uh, Green Belt. And uh, then in 1961, this chap got involved. He's Lou, so late, later Sir Lou Sherman, leader of Hackney Council. And he picked up Abercrombie's idea. His initial concept was quite narrow. He, uh, uh, his town clerk sent a letter to the clerks of the old pre-GLC boroughs of West Ham, Leighton, Walthamstow and Tottenham. Can we get together and use this open space and do something with it? Uh, Lou, who became quite repetitious in his old age when I got to know him quite well, always used to uh, refer to jazzy little cafes as his concept of what the new smart and up Lee Valley would incorporate. I could just see it with check floors and Johnny Dankworth score and um, 1960s. Uh, short-skirted. No, I'll, I'll, I won't go there. I'll get into trouble. So I'll, I'll carry on. Um, uh, anyway, this initial modest conception metastasized as Middlesex County Council and later the GLC and Essex and Hearts all got involved and also the, uh, the boroughs outside London of Broxbourne and East Hearts and Epping Forest. So they clubbed together and they decided they would ask the Civic Trust to do a report about what could be done. 
Uh, those of us who remember the Civic Trust uh, will think of it as a rather crusty, nimbiest organisation that didn't want to change anything, wanted to preserve old buildings uh, and not much else. But in the 60s, it came under the leadership of Leslie Lane, who'd previously been the chief planner at LCC and been doing massive slum clearance programmes in the East End and was a great believer in the power of planning. And his, uh, his, uh, uh, the main author of the report, a man who's, who's still around and who uh, I interviewed recently, was Michael Dower, who had also been a planner working on slum clearance programmes. Um, in the light of what I say subsequently, it will be, it's interesting to know that Michael Dower stood by every word of the con conception which he, uh, he outlined in this report. So, um, sorry, yes, that's it. That's, that's the, the picture on the inside cover of the Civic Trust report. It's a, it's a picture I've looked at a great deal. And uh, it is to the credit of the Lee Valley conception that not all that much has changed. Most of the open space is there. Uh, there are one or two bits that have gone, but uh, don't have time to really go into that now. One thing that's quite interesting, on the bottom right-hand side, there's another uh, reservoir with islands, which is no longer there, and that is now the site of the Copper Mills Waterworks. So this is how it starts. The Valley is London's kitchen garden, it's well, it's privy in its workshop. It's treated as London's backyard because it lies at everybody's boundary. The land not used for heavy necessities remains damped and derelict, damp and derelict unheeded and ill-kempt. In a new day, these acres could become East London's playground. Isaac Walton's River could again give delight as a place of leisure and recreation. Nice. And then the new leisure. Well, the psalmist said, man goeth forth to his work and to his labour until the evening. Contrast that with the Bishop of Coventry newly installed in a brand new cathedral designed by Sir Basil Spence, architect of uh, Sussex universities and other iconic buildings of the 60s. The time is coming when man may well go out to his work for two hours a day and face the rest of his day as a gentleman of leisure. I think some of us can remember that kind of stuff in the 60s. Mind you, if you can remember, some people say if you can remember the 60s, then you weren't there. Um, talking of which, these are some of the uh, uh, conceptions. This was going to be the Lee Bridge Fun Fair to rival Tivoli Gardens in Copenhagen. This was going to be a... Uh, um, a mall. Uh, you can see the Abbey Mills uh, pumping station there, um, down uh, uh, in Newham, where they behind the Three Mill Centre. And this was jo Joan Littlewood's famous Fun Palace, a giant movable, collapsible mechanical gantry, and a place for a phantasmagoria of leisure. Uh, the Fun Palace was probably a fantasy rather than a practical suggestion even in the 1960s, although Joan Littlewood thought otherwise. Uh, um, Michael Dower also was author of a, a booklet, The Challenge of Leisure, uh, which expanded on the ideas in the Civic uh, Trust report about how the hell were we going to spend all the free time that machines would give us, whatever happened to that. Um, so uh, I've got these two slides the wrong order. The, 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 the Civic Trust is quite a poetic document, but all of this had to be translated into prose. And that was the Lee Valley Regional Park Act, 1966. It was a private act of parliament. It set up a regional park and a regional park authority. It's funded by the pre precept from the whole of the GLC, Hearts and Essex which meant that Harridge and Harrow spent as much as Hackney per head on the um, um, park. And that uh, turned out to be rather dangerous, as we shall see. A uh, political deal, although the GLC provided 80% of the funding and Hearts and Essex 
the Hearts and Essex uh, members were 50% of the, uh, the membership of the authority. And that was to stop a socialist GLC from spending too much money. But it did also mean that the, the Park Authority has had a perpetual Tory majority, and this was to have consequences later, as we shall see. So going back, they uh, uh, again, a more prosaic document. This is the uh, first master plan in 1969. It's a kind of scaled down version of the Civic Trust uh, report. It still has the um, vaunting ambition but spelt in rather more prosaic terms. And the map had a um, series of leisure hotspots. Uh, and here's the one at Eastway at the bottom of the end of Hackney Marshes, entertainment and fun, sh shops, restaurants, bars, galleries, fun fair, cinema, dance hall, studios, together with riverside walks and woodlands. So um, that was quite a... A high ambition. It was considered to be affordable in the 1960s, um, but that point of view didn't last very long. Uh, the Park Authority set about their uh, task with a will and they built a number of leisure centres and the two flagship, flagship projects were Pickett's Lock at Enfield the architecture of the Lee Valley Park Authority has always been singularly unlovely, as you can see. And there was another leisure centre at Broxbourne. The Lee Valley Leisure Centre had a pool with a wave machine, which was then at the cutting edge of what swimming pools were. So it was a cut above the local municipal bars that everyone went to. And this was a regional facility which would attract um, uh, people from far and wide. That was the theory anyway. Uh, in our part of the world, uh, the Park Authority uh, built the old cycle track at Hackney Wick, which was obliterated by the uh, Olympic Games site. The stables at uh, Leebridge Road, just over in Waltham Forest, were from that period. And they also bought and have maintained subsequently the boating marina at Springfield. It was fun, fun, fun all the way. I was going to say, till her daddy comes home. And uh, this is um, Dobbs Weir, where they came up with the idea of a children's paradise, which would feature a fairy castle, Niagara type falls, where they had those ready made on a smaller scale, a mock up of a New Orleans seamer, and a California miners' settlement. There wasn't any real interest in open space. It had to be things that you built and paid to go into. It was, uh, can you take down my pitch? I can't read my slide at the moment. Um, is there a way of doing that? Um, sorry, I'll try to do it. The Sunday afternoon walk will give way to experiments in canoeing or archery or even horse riding. Class differences in the people spend their spare, way that people spend their pay, pay, spare time will disappear. They will have to. There will be no room for separate development. I found that quote in a Sunday Times article from 1971, inspired obviously by the, the press people of the uh, Lee Valley Park in those days. It sounds a bit sinister and totalitarian to me and, and I expect to you. Uh, park Authority also had this concept of a park road running the length of the park, which would give swift and easy access for motorists wanting to move from one part of the park to another. This is the only bit that was ever built. It runs between the North Circular and Pickett's Lock, and I used to cycle along it regularly. You can still reach it from the Pickett's Lock side, but the North Circular side has been... Um, uh, blocked by additions to the Edmonton incinerator plant, very appropriately. You could see, I think it was the only road in the time, maybe still is, that ran through an electricity pylon. Well, this, uh, this um, approach ran into trouble in the more ecologically minded 70s. And uh, the big trouble that the park had was in Walthamstow Marshes, which they, they'd got planning permission to dig up the marshes for gravel 
and at the end there was going to be a boating lake and they got planning permission and they let it lapse and they reapplied expecting that that would sail through on a post that had done the first time but by chance uh, it was noticed by Mike Knowles who lived in Clapton and that led to the brilliant and incredible Save the Masters campaign in which I was slightly involved. Um, a campaign documented the ecological importance of the marshes, of which the Park Authority had not a clue because they didn't have any ecological knowledge at all. The campaign ran rings around the Park Authority and the planning consent was turned down by the GLC. If you went to Walthamstone marshes up to a few months ago, you'd have seen a number of uh, interpretation boards that look like this. And if you home in, so in the 1970s, Walthamstone Marsh was under threat of development. The discovery of Adder's Tongue found here by local people helped convince the authorities to protect the marsh. Well, this was a bit brazen on the part of the authority because they put out the notice and they neglected to say that the authorities who were threatening the marsh with development was the Lee Valley Park Authority themselves. Uh, it inspired Mike Knowles to write a 24,000 word, rather emotional and repetitious diatribe recalling what actually happened, which you can find if you're interested by Googling the saving of Walthamstow marshes. Those boards have now been taken away now, even, even the Park Authority recognised that was a bit brazen of them. Uh, Another flank was opened, and this is where I was primarily involved, with the Lee Valley Association. And I could have another whole talk about how that got uh, came into being. Uh, this is a piece of juvenilia which I wrote, which came out in 1980. The Lee Valley, time for a rethink. What we said was that this 1969 master plan was too uh, devoted to bricks and mortar and the park authority needed to rip up the vaster plan and um, have a new one, which was altogether greener. Uh, we brought out a series of booklets. New Life for the Lee was about um, uh, uh, restoring the Bowback Rivers and freedom to wander, that's self-explanatory. Um, well, the Park Authority did tear up the master plan and they did bring out a new master plan in 1986, which was much, much better. The then chief executive said to me, you're not to give yourself any credit for this. It would have happened without you. In fact, it probably would have happened quicker if you hadn't made such a fuss, which I thought was a bit ungenerous. I think, I think we did uh, um, change the course of things at that stage, although trying to influence the, the uh, park since has proved pretty uphill work. Um, one of the things we helped persuade them to do was to buy the derelict Middlesex filter beds. Uh, the Park Authority's first conception, incredibly, was that the bed should be uh, filled in to make additional football pitches in addition to the 128 that were already there. Um, and uh, they did, and they also bought the Essex beds, and those are spaces which I think many of us very much value today. This shows the uh, filter beds when they had water in, they're, they're dry, but uh, the Park Authority are trying to get water back. Um, the, uh, uh, the best achievement in the 80s and 90s, I think, was a country park at Fisher's Green. These are the reed beds um, at uh, 70 Acre Lake, which the Park uh, Authority planted. And if you go there and you're very lucky, you may see the elusive bittern um, skulking around. They're not hard to see, but I have, I have seen them there on a handful of occasions. And it's a place to wander and jolly to nice it is. And uh, I, I go there often, especially on crisp winter mornings. Uh, the Park Authority's bricks and mortar ambitions were not entirely set aside. This was the uh, ice rink. Um, which they built in the 1980s. It's funny, I can still remember the architectural model that was shown to us. It looked quite nice, all shielded by, shielded by trees, but uh, the trees they planted all died because of lack of sufficient aftercare. 
Um, and there's a, a positively shot of the interior. And we'll come back to that later. They also later on um, built the Lee Valley Athletics Center. This was originally going to be a hundred million uh, pound job to house the 19, uh, 2005 World Athletics Championship. It got scaled down to a more modest 16 million pound center, um, mostly funded by the DCMS and the National Lottery. And if you're interested in these things, Greg Rutherford, who got a, a gold at Beijing, I think, for the long jump, regularly used to train there. And there's an interior shot. So, um, what happened? Well, the first thing that went wrong was was this man, Ken Livingstone, and the man in the uh, background is Tony Banks, who had responsibility for um, um, the Lee Valley uh, relationship between the GLC and the Lee Valley after Ken McIntosh staged a putsch and deposed Andrew McIntosh and became GLC leader. Uh, Ken Lewings, uh, Tony Banks was a famously rude man. Uh, he called Nicholas Soames a one-man food mountain, and he said that Terry Dix, a Tory MP, was living proof that a pig's bladder on a stick can get elected to Parliament. He wasn't someone who set about um, endearing himself to people he didn't like. I don't, don't think he liked me very much at the time we met. He was the most insufferably arrogant, unlistening, overbearing person I think I've ever met in my life. Anyway, that didn't do much good because up till then, the, the Park Authority had been non-political and the chairmanship rotated with political control of the GLC. After that, the Tories said, sod you, and they've, they've basically run the, um, the, the, the Park Authority as a Tory-controlled entity ever since, helped by the overrepresentation of Harps and Essex, which I've told you about. Uh, the other person, I'm sorry to uh, bring her into it, uh, but uh, Margaret Thatcher abolished the GLC and um, that meant that uh, far off boroughs like Richmond and uh, Kingston, instead of paying the um, for the Lee Valley as part of their preset from the GLC, actually got a demand uh, for money every year. And there's been an increasing clamour from uh, South London boroughs to say, why should we pay for this park? We don't get there, cost Kingston taxpayers 181,350 so forth. I find Kingston rather rich because we all pay for Richmond Park uh, through general taxes, but uh, Kingston ratepayers don't, uh, don't fancy paying for a poxy little park in East London. Uh, the other thing that, 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 that sort of went wrong, I think, was this regional vision, uh, regional facilities, uh, got um, transformed into a world-class vision. Uh, the Olympic Games had a lot to do with that. Um, this is in the original colour scheme. Park has pledged for leisure, remains firmly at the future, our aspiration, our ambition has grown, we, we want to become a truly world-class destination, committed in developing, developing operating world-class sports facilities as a legacy of London 2012. And they did, of course, get uh, certainly two world-class facilities as legacy venues. This is the White Water Centre at Waltham Cross, and this is the velodrome at the Olympic Games maybe not also uh, quite world-class, but there's the Olympic uh, Tennis and Hockey Centre. So um, we have uh, a Tory-controlled uh, authority, um, uh, far-off councils whinging, world-class ambitions, and they have, uh, they, they've cut the precept a great deal. So it's uh, doing bigger and big, bigger projects on less and less money. Um, their latest scheme, which many of you will know about, is to replace the ice rink with a twin pad ice centre at uh, Lee Bridge. There it is, one, one pad for international uh, events and one for uh, as a, uh, an ice centre 
for you and me. And uh, that was as good like the, uh, going to look like allegedly. I mean, I think these computer generated images obviously flatter to deceive, but they've got planning permission for that and provided they don't run out of money, which they actually might, but uh, leaving that possibility aside, that's going to be going up before our eyes in the next few years. And the next big project, uh, bringing the latest technology in wave machines to pick its lock, so you could say what comes round comes round, is a joint venture with a private company called the, World, the Wave to have a world-class surfing venue at Pickett's Lock on the site of the old Pickett's Lock Centre. I was, I, I was quicker than I thought. How long have I been, Ray? I could have lingered longer. I could have got rabbit on, rabbited on more. Laurie, you have been going for um, nearly 30 minutes. Oh, right. Well, that's great. Have we got any questions? I'll, uh, yes, yes, we do. Would you like to have some? Yeah, yeah. Shall I look at my chat and then I can see them? You can do it that way or I can relay them to you. All right. You, you, you read them out. Okay, right. We're going to have your question first. Your planted question. <laughs> the question, first question I invite you to ask. Uh, ask. Ask away. But please, the rest of you, are ask questions because I love I love answering questions about the history of the Lee Valley Park. It's one of my favourite occupations. Question number one is: Knowing what you know now, Laurie, would you would you still support setting up the park, the Lee Valley Park, back in the sixties? I think, on balance, the park authority is just about positive. If you go back to that slide that aerial shot going um, looking down, the fact that most of the open space has been preserved, I think is um, um, probably wouldn't have been the case uh, without the park being created. I forgot to mention uh, the park authority is not a planning authority that was considered uh, like the Broads Authority in the national parks. It does have certain planning powers and uh, I won't go into those. So, um, on balance, just about, but I wish it had stayed with Lou Sherman's original conception, a little consortium of um, local London boroughs, jazzy cafes, and uh, not these higher vaunting um, ambitions. There are, there, there's a Wondell uh, Valley Park in South London, the Colne Valley Park uh, in, to the west of London, uh, the Tame Valley Park is another one um, in Greater Manchester, which are much smaller things with less funding, less authoritarian, less um, overambitious. As, and having my time again, that's what I would have gone for. It's rather unfortunate that the, it all metastasized, as I say, into something rather large and a little bit horrible. Okay, Laurie. Um, I'll mention the, the next question because I promised Panda Murray I would. We don't know the answer. Um, we can confess. But uh, Panda asked uh, if we could sh shed some light on some of the metal plaques that you see in the Waterworks Nature Reserve, which have the initials NR. NR. Now, yeah. I'm sure somebody out there will know the answer. So if they can use the chat facility. I have seen this question an and I've seen the plaques. Uh, and I can only think it stands for Nature Reserve. It's certainly got nothing to do with the New River. I, I um, And I can't think of an acronym. I mean, the Metropolitan Water Board and the East London Waterworks Company, I mean, those, uh, those who are involved. I can't, I can't think what NR stands for other than Nature Reserves. But whether okay, that, well, it well we've, put it, we've put it out there, so let's yeah. leave it like that. Yeah. Now, Val Monday asks, was the wave machine at the swimming pool at Pickett's Lock or Broxbourne? Both. Okay. Thank As you. I say, a wave machine was, um, it's, it's interesting how the concept of regional has grown. Now, the fact that a swimming pool with a wave machine was going to um, draw people from far and wide. So, you know, regional 
aspirations were pitched at that level, something a bit bigger and better than what your local council could provide. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a wave machine in um, Britannia Leisure Centre not long afterwards, so it, it, it didn't remain cutting edge. But the uh, the new cutting edge, um, the new cutting edge world class vision, I'm not so keen on. Next question from uh, from Nick from Nick Perry. The Middlesex filter beds are split into two: the Canal Side Park and the Nature Reserve with the hides for bird watching. Are they under separate management? Why don't we have just one one space there? Uh, I did actually think of putting up a, a slide. The uh, the Middlesex beds and the Essex beds, and they were always known as that, were part of the Lee Bridge Waterworks. Um, and there were a third set of beds, which were all concreted over uh, in the area in between, which is now a great car park and building site. And uh, my good friends um, in Save Lee Masters are campaigning to have restored as an open air uh, swimming swimming venue. Uh, both were uh, acquired by the Lee Valley Park. I think the Middlesex bed before the Essex beds, and both are administered by the um, the park authority. Uh, the park authority have made the decision up to now that you can't. The only way you can get into the Essex beds is going right round to the other side, onto the waterworks site. Uh, so that makes them quite yeah. separate. Uh, the rationale for that is so people don't use the Essex beds as a, as a through route. Um, on balance, I slightly disagree with that, but they are under one management. Next from James Diamond. Do you know of any plans for the old pool at Broxbourne? Ha, yes, I do. The old pool at Broxbourne was demolished in about 2006 and there is a car park there. And the Lee Valley Park have been strenuously lobbying Broxbourne Borough Council that it should be rezoned for housing uh, because it's close to Broxbourne <laughs> Station and they should get they could get a hell of a lot of money if it was zoned for housing. That was considered by the inspector in the Broxbourne local plan, who said no, the, the Lee Valley is a is a firm hard boundary between open built up land to the west and open land to the east and so it should not be zoned for housing the park authority is still trying to get it developed for 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 housing it is rather ironic that the park authority when you bear in mind abercrombie's conception of preserving an open air space and no land being built on it that they are the people trying as hard as they can to get land uh, rezoned for um for building land uh, uh, they're not succeeding yet, but they, they're, they're trying. I could talk. I did decide that I wasn't going to talk about the current day politics of Lee Valley. I could go on for ages, but it, it's too depressing. I'll fire another question at you in that case. Um, Camilla Allwood asks, from where has demand for an international skating centre come? Oh, the Park Authority have consulted up to the... Um, to the, the hilt on that you know they've they've done all the groundwork with that and you won't be surprised that they've consulted heavily among the uh, sporting and skating community who are very keen to be fair <coughs> when this ice rink was built in the 80s it was partly built with sports council money and it was a condition that the uh, the rank would uh, the rink would be reserved for uh training for elite skaters for several hours each day which is not satisfactory uh, so uh, when there are two pads there will be one continuously open for the public and um, one for international events okay you're happy for one or two more Laurie? yes yes yeah, yeah far Keep away. On coming. Um, molly who is a landscape architecture student asks what kind of development if any would you support within the park? Oh, uh, this will become clearer when I do the second half of my show. I, 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 um, I want the park to be beautiful. Freedom to wander is still um, my motif. And those of you who have never been to Fisher Screen, um, it represents to me 
you know, it's pretty ideal. It's it's a space which is beautiful, which has been made accessible, tidied up to a very small extent, good paths, and um, um, it's just gorgeous. There, there's a lot that could be done in the London end. There's still... A, there is a, a, a school of thought, and I'm sure there are some people watching who I know who would support that, that the more wild and, and untended places are, the more um, ecological diversity there are. I, I, I am a, a, a moderate on that. I, I, I would like some prettification tidying up, and I certainly think there could be a lot more access routes we asked ages ago that there should be a gate from Copper Mill into the Walthamstow reservoirs, and that was finally brought about. I'll talk about that in my second half uh, a few years ago. And it's made a huge difference, the number of people visiting the park and accessibility and the round walks. There are several other, uh, another bridge we campaigned for, which was built, whether it's because of us going on about it or not, I don't know. It's a bridge called Friends Bridge, which goes from Hackney Marshes and then winds up towards the aqueduct path. There are other bridges and, and connections and accesses. Um, and one I'd mention in particular, it would not be very difficult to make a connection between Walthamstow Marsh and the playing fields at Low Hall. In fact, I used to regularly to walk that way in the 70s when there were broken down fences and desire paths that that link could be created that would weld together open spaces uh, and um, that would make the whole area more interesting more enjoyable more possibilities to want that's the kind of thing i'm keenest on just to just just to expand that question slightly laurie i mean is there a is there a building you can envisage that would add to the uh, people's enjoyment of the park. <laughs> We're talking of bridges, but what about buildings? Well, I'll, 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 I'll give you, for instance, something which has been built recently. Um, there's a bird hide where I used to go and see bittens in Fisher's Green, which was falling into the mud because it was built on dodgy foundations. And the park authority, it was very much initiative of one man in the authority, replaced it with a, a new wildlife interpretation centre. I thought when I saw the plans, it was going to be horrible, but but it's nice. So that's a for instance. OK, OK. All right, let's move on to another question. Freddie Gray asks, would you say that the Flood Relief Channel has been effective since in its inception? How possible will it be for water to return to the filter beds? Well, as a first thing, uh, uh, my ex bought a, a flat on the old Latham site in, in Clapton. And when uh, her solicitor did her searches, she said, oh, this is dodgy. There were floods there in 1947 and there were regular floods. And then they built the flood relief channel in the 50s and 60s. And uh, it's never failed or come near to, to, to failing to my knowledge. So, so far, so good. But then the Thames barrier was meant to be good for a thousand years and was never intended to be lowered. This had, has had to be lowered several times, so you can never be sure. Um, as to the water in the filter beds, the Park Authority is not entirely the villain of the piece. They did have a um, generator which was pumping water from the Revillian into the filter beds, which was stolen. Quite a big thing to steal. And they are working on a new thing, which is to create a, a channel under the towpath from uh, the, the navigation to provide water to the filter beds again. Uh, I believe them when they say they're, they're, they're working on it. So I think water will return. OK, Karina uh, Townsend um, is asking, does the Park Authority have the authority to impose fines on persistent polluters, which have a devastating impact on the Lower Lee. She's thinking of the ancient reed beds at Bow Creek. <laughs> I, um, I've, I've, I've thought about fines because I, I shouldn't say this, but there is a, a gravel pit uh, 
up in the upper valley uh, where I like indulging in wild swimming. And I was ferociously bawled out by a Lee Valley Park Authority warden. And uh, the Lee Valley bylaws prohibit you from swimming on any open space of water in, in the park. So I was rendering myself open to fines. And, and I complained to the chief executive. I thought it was a bit heavy handed and he, he agreed with me. But there are bylaws I don't know about. Um, they are, if you go onto the Lee Valley Regional Park Authority website uh, and click the right tab, the bylaws are there for inspection. I don't know the answer, but uh, yes, if it's in the bylaws. And I would have thought polluting water probably is a bylaw breach. Whether the Park Authority would actually do anything about it, another matter. But then again, they didn't do anything about me swimming, so I shouldn't be complaining, should I? Okay. Okay, Laurie. Um, we've had about 15 minutes of questions and answers. Would you like to press on with a few more or carry on to second half? Let's do two more and then we'll do the rest. Okay. So Annette Russell asks... The Park Authority seems keen to commercialise the marshes with a recent licence application being refused by Waltham Forest. Any idea why the cafe by the nature reserve is not being used? It seems to be a wasted opportunity. <laughs> I could spend half an hour on that question. I mean, um, this question was about the Waterworks Meadow um, going up Leebridge Road. Uh, um, a few hundred yards from Lee Bridge and, and turning right, there's a an interpretation centre there which is now closed and a, a, a meadow behind which used to be a golf course. Uh, basically, uh, the Park Authority, the Tories on the Park Authority, to be precise, uh, agreed that a large part of that should be zoned for housing. Outrageous. Uh, and they were going to... Um, uh, sell that for development to pay for the ice rink. Uh, the force of local opposition to that was such that um, they, they backed down on that. Um, the future of the Waterworks Centre is, is very much under discussion. Uh, they say they want to open it in the short term as an interpretation centre again, but it's fairly clear to me that their long-term ambition is to... Um, change its planning status so they can make money from, from it. That's the, the business model they've adopted. They will run these big facilities on a low precept by selling off land. But, you know, oh, that's that's a, a big, big can of worms. OK, I have two more questions, Laurie. Let's... Um, well, by the way, answers, sa sa Save Lee Marshes, if you look, that organisation in which I participate is... is um, working very hard to make the authority do the right thing. But by God, it's an uphill struggle. Two, two more for you, but uh, short answers, please. Morris Winby asks, is there history to the footbridges crossing at Argal Way, that's Argal Way, over the East Anglia Mainline Railway to the Lee Valley Riding Centre? Well, there's a lot of history in the sense that it's on the line of the Black Path, also known as a Market Porter's Route. Um, if you go over to the Waltham Forest side, there's a diagonal path which runs past the uh, Kings Mill Bread Factory. And uh, sliced bread smells surprisingly delicious when it's being baked. And then uh, there's the bridge. And then you pick up the diagonal track later on. It runs uh, uh, in front of Hackney Town Hall and down through London Fields. And that is all one path, um, uh, which was a market traders route uh, serving the, the city of London. The precise history of it is, is rather, um, rather murky. There's a very good article by Katie Andrews, and I'm not sure if it's on the web or not about all of that. Um, I'll get it put on the Save Lee Marshes uh, website. That'd be a good idea. I, I, I can say that that bridge is on that route and I think it's probably there because of that route, but I can't say any more than that. Okay, and finally, um, Richard Scarborough has a question. Is there any mechanism to protect the Hackney, Walthamstow and Tottenham Marshes from surrounding tower blocks? 
which are changing the views and open character of the marshes so significantly? Well, the Park Authority is a statutory consultee uh, and can object to um, overbearing developments adjacent. Uh, it's been conspicuously weak about doing so, and that will come up in one of the two of the slides I'm going to show in a minute. Um, I think one little bit of my um, campaigning activity, I objected to um, a rather large building being uh, um, erected where the Tottenham lock, lock Keepers house now is. Uh, the Park Authority, uh, the draft to members was that they should not object, but they should make recommendations. I persuaded them the Park Authority should object to it. Um, when I spoke at the Haringey Planning Committee, I said the Park Authority had objected and the planning officer said, no, the Park Authority hadn't raised any objections which couldn't be met by conditions, which was untrue. And I complained to uh, the chair of the Lee Valley Planning Committee and he was very cross about it. And he said the Park Authority is going to try harder in the future to, to make its voice heard. Um, whether that will happen or not. Um, I don't know. So we've okay. got the rest of my slides now. Yes, thank you, Laurie. On to the second half. And if we have any more questions, we might get a bit of extra time. OK. Oh, hi, here we are. Let's go there. Uh, right. On to screen share. Yeah, hang on. There we are. So... Lee Valley Park, a journey through space. Uh, I hope I'm not going to be disappointing. There are only a few old slides in there, which Alan Denny, who, who did the last Hackney Society event, has very kindly digitised and touched up uh, for me, although some of them have a slightly old-fashioned look, which is nice. So this is a mixture of old slides and modern slides, and one or two I've dragged down from various sources. So I thought, am I going to do my journey from top to bottom or bottom to top? And I decided to go top to bottom. So starting in Hartford. Uh, Hartford is a termination of the Lee navigation, although the park only goes uh, as far as Ware, which is about three miles further down the Lee. A lovely, a lovely uh, town. Uh, you can cycle up to Hartford on the towpath. Uh, that Georgian building is the Hartford Club, backs onto the river. If anybody happens to have reciprocal membership of the Hartford Club and would take me out to lunch there, I'd love to. I'd love to go and uh, go inside the Hartford Club. And if you do go there, uh, there it has a particularly lovely railway station, which will convey you back to uh, Hackney Downs when times change. Uh, there's a rather moody picture of the uh, Hartford Weir. The Lee is already quite a substantial river at that stage. Uh, it's by that stage you've had the convergence of the um, the River Lee, the Rim River Mimram, and the River Bean, all chalk streams, as I say, and it's joined later on by the River uh, Rib, the River Ash and the River Stort to become the mighty river we know. Um, that's between uh, Hartford and where? That is the new gauge uh, and a majority, nearly, uh, in fact, all of the water of the new river um, came, uh, came from there. Uh, originally, the new river was fed by springs from Amwell and Chadwell, but they both dried up. So. Uh, they, um, they built this gauge to draw water off from the River Lee. It caused an awful lot of kerfuffle. When it was built, there were still mills and weirs and fishing rights and so forth. And all the mill owners complained that the New River Company was pinching their water. That's an old slide, but it looks exactly the same now. Uh, those are Maltings buildings at Ware. Um, there are maltings or former maltings buildings at uh, 
Bishop Stalford and Sawbridgeworth on the Stort and uh, Ware and Stand Stood Abbots on the Lee. Um, that was one of the staple trades of the medieval Lee navigation. The barley was grown in the fields of Hertfordshire and Cambridgeshire, taken to be malted and then carried down by barge into the city of London. Those are the famous and lovely gazebos of Ware. They, they, that's an old slide, but uh, uh, they're still there. The, um, the wealthy uh, people who built uh, houses on the main street in Ware had long gardens uh, backing onto the Lee, and they built these places to um, quietly contemplate. It would be a lovely place for a home office in the era we now live in, wouldn't it? Uh, that's boating club between uh, Stanislaus Abbots and Aware, looking up to very nice countryside on the, the Essex side. Uh, this is a rather sad story. Um, there, were, there was another very fine Mortings building uh, just to the north of Stanislaus Abbots, and I tried really hard, this is 40 or more years ago, to persuade the park authority that would make a fantastic centre for, uh, I was asked about buildings I would like to see or have seen. I would like to have seen that a place for uh, a, a, a museum and interpretation centre, um, sharing the history of the navigation of the supply of water, of fun and frolics, everything about the Lee, um, Anyway, the Lee Valley Park Authority didn't want to know and they demolished the maltings and there is pastiche in action. Um, I don't always dislike pastiche, but uh, I saw my heart sinks whenever I pass that one, thinking what might have been. This is Rye House. Um, the Rye House plot. In 1683, um, conspirators were concerned that uh, Charles and particularly his brother and heir James were going in too popish a direction and they planned to waylay them on the way back from the Newmarket races and do them in. Um, unfortunately for the plotters, um, the, there was a fire at Newmarket and the king and the his brother, who became James II, until overthrown in 1688, travelled home early and the plotters were thwarted. That's an old shot, but that's uh, still how it looks. I'm pretty sure this is one of my old slides, and I, I'm pretty sure this is um, the scene opposite uh, Rye House. Um, uh, if, if that's if it's of something else, it might possibly be Stratford. I don't think it is. Well, that's very much what it looks like if you go to Rye House now. It very much demonstrates the fact that the Lee has been quite a hard border between uh, urbanisation on one side, and um, pretty urbanisation, and um, open country on the other. Uh, the reason I took that picture, I think when I took it is, I've always felt that the... Park Authority, and this is one of the questions, has done a singularly inept or non-job at protecting the margins between the park and the adjacent uh, adjacent land. That could have been, you could have taken boundaries back, you could have had fences, but that hasn't happened up to now to any extent. And that's because the Park Authority hasn't really... Um, really done anything about it but the 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 the, the planning chap at Lee Valley said they're going to do better in the future we shall see uh, this is a scene on the river going down I'm, I'm I'm heading down the river all the time as, as you can see down between Stanton's Abbots and Dobbs Weir and uh, those pylons are emanating from the uh, Rye House power station uh, that and the power station at Enfield were both coal-fired and they were both replaced by gas-powered stations in Mrs uh, Thatcher's dash for gas. Uh, there's uh, Dobbs Weir again. 
a very pretty spot. And there's a hell of a lot of water going over it, especially in high water. I thought I'd show you a pub. The pubs on the Lee are uniformly, uniformly disappointing. Uh, this is the best of a bad bunch, you know, the fish and eels. It, it should be a very lovely pub, but if you go there, the vibe isn't, uh, isn't to my taste. I think you'll... Uh, um, you'll see what I mean if you go there. But I do occasionally have a drink um, there and look at the water going by. Below Rye House, um, look, um, going towards Broxbourne, there's an area called Carthagena. There's um, um, lovely shimmering poplars along that stretch of the water. My wife June and I encountered a very aggressive crayfish on this stretch of the towpath once it reared up its claws at us um not daunted by our greater size Broxbourne was it was, was one of the hot spots in the um, in the lee valley plan a cut inland leisure resort they they mowed some meadows they built some chalets they built this boating center and the Lido, which, as I said before, has been demolished and which they now want to make over for housing. This boating centre, if you go up there, it's become very popular with the Hasidic community. You can get a, a train up from Stamford Hill, uh, change at Cheshire for Broxbourne, and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see uh, men with beards and their lads um, rowing up and down the river at Broxbourne on a summer's day. Uh, this is another pretty awful pub, in my opinion, um, um, at Broxbourne. I put it up because the woods behind were pleasure grounds in the, in the 19th century. Um, I am trying to get on with writing a book about the Rivoli, and I, I want to do a good deal of research about the Victorian pleasure grounds um, on the Lee difficult to do these things when archives are closed. That's uh, an old picture which um, the countryside opens up between Broxbourne and uh, and uh, and uh, the edge of London really. And these are some uh, curious cows looking at me across the river. And then you come to the country park. These are some some uh, modern slides I've taken, which I love. I've, uh, this is a place called Holyfield Weir. Uh, we go there on on all our walks, and um, it's as beautiful as that looks. I recommend it. And if you are a cyclist, takes hour and a quarter or so, hour and a half, depending whether you're getting on with it or or poodling to go up to the um, Fisher's Green by bike, and there's lots of lovely bike paths. Those are the reed beds again, which I mentioned before. Waltham Abbey, uh, that's an old old uh, digitised slide. The, the, the Park Authority uh, acquired the, the Abbey Gardens. I think they are very, very boringly planted and gardened. Um, we used to go to the tea room called Philpots at Waltham Abbey, just by the Abbey itself. And, you know, it's one of those things like Schmitz in Charlotte Street. There's some things that pass, but you never quite forget them. But the Abbey is very, very lovely. I, uh, a, a beautiful Norman Abbey. Can't recommend it enough. Now we're heading into London. This is between Enfield Lot and Ponder's End, um, the industrial area of Brimsdown on the left-hand side. On the right, you can see the slopes of the King George V Reservoir, and there's one uh, field, a uh, field width of open space in between. Um, I put this slide up particularly because uh, when the Park Authority had a proposal for a park road, they were going to put the park road on stilts on this stretch so that motorists could have elevated position enjoying a view over the reservoir to Epping Forest. Wouldn't that have been nice? Um, 
that's uh, just a little byway. That's the uh, the 18th century Wright's flower mill at Ponders End. Very, very difficult to get in there. Many years ago, I was uh, I was uh, lucky enough to have a guided tour, and you can still see Wright's flower in uh, Hell Shop near you. Now we are uh, on the river, uh, uh, looking south. I am. 90% confident between um, Ponders End and the North Circular Road. On the left now we have the, um, um, no, I haven't 100% cut. On the left we have the William Girling Reservoir. Quite an austere stretch of the river. Uh, there's another view of the Park Road, which is uh, at, the, at this stretch, with the William Girling on the right. This is a picture of Tottenham Marshes. Um, again, I, I think some people will will disagree with me what I'm going to say next. Tottenham Marsh is effectively managed as wilded open space. Um, it does it does look much better now. It is it is better managed than it was then. In fact, it wasn't managed then. A lot of open spaces have a very forlorn, unkempt, neglected, no one cares about us, you know, uh, inviting people to dump wrecked cars and, and, and so forth. Uh, that, I'm sure, this is an old slide, was what I was uh, trying to illustrate in this. If you go to the same spot now, it is still wild, but it is a lot nicer. So there has been some forward progress and there's a very active uh, user group in Tottenham Marsh which keeps the park authority up to scratch. Then you get to the reservoirs, these are all uh, uh, shots I've dragged down from the net. Uh, the park authority sometimes in their more brazen moment claim uh, credit for the, the Walthamstow wetlands. It was actually the initiative of one very um, uh, plucky woman called Rose Jaiji who persuaded Waltham, uh, Forest, uh, Waltham Forest Council to take it on as a scheme, wrote the lottery funding, uh, persuaded Thames Water to, uh, to cooperate and uh, brought about the wonderful open space. And, you know, it's, it's, it's precious. And I, I, I go there lots during lockdown. And the excellent cafe is uh, still open for takeaways. And uh, these are a couple more uh, library shots of the, the reservoirs. And that's the uh, a picture of the marine house, which has been restored by a Hackney firm of architects, William Witherson Mann. And the chimney there has been rebuilt with um, nesting boxes for San Martins, although they haven't come yet, so far as I know. This is an old shot, uh, but you could still, on a good day, uh, see the same thing now. Uh, I think many of you will recognise it as the rowing club at the bottom of Spring Hill. What strikes me about this shot is uh, the rowing club is run by a private charitable organisation. The park authority has nothing to do with it, and it's full of life. I think a feature of the park authority facilities they like facilities with kind of monolithic buildings that you go pay for, rather um, un indifferent, not very friendly staff, and no sense of animation. Uh, the question I I I, I like I like things with animation. So, uh, but I'm not sure the park authority is the right uh, body to do that. They have never chosen to use any of their funds, to my knowledge, although could have, could have done to support organisations um, promoting sport and recreation along the Lee. You're either, it's either, either our show or, or we don't want to know. That seems to be their approach. Uh, these are the Walthamstow marshes. Um, as I say, um, when, when the, uh, the Save the Marshes campaign did an incredible job of documenting the flora and fauna, 
the park authority didn't know what to say because they they didn't know that there was anything living there and they certainly didn't know if anything living there was what it was so they really were in no position to argue with the uh with the argument that's the old uh, latham's timber yard and you can see on the right hand side some of the barges uh some of the older members among us will remember the uh, timber barges going up and down the Leith. And this picture kindly supplied by my fellow Hackney Society Committee member, Julia Lafferty, is a picture of the interior of the timber yard, which she campaigned to get listed without success. And that's what you've got there now. Those uh, that that was Lay, uh, Latham's phase one, designed, conceived in the eighties, built in the nineties at a low density, when people hadn't cottoned on to the fact that London's population was about to start going up instead of uh, slipping as it had been done, and phase two is built at a much higher elevation and density. This is the aqueduct. Um, the Lee Bridge Waterworks, which closed in the 1960s, were fed by this aqueduct coming down from Walthamstow Reservoirs. And the aqueduct was still there into, I think, the early 80s. And I once saw the rather bizarre uh, spectacle of a frogman swimming along the aqueduct and uh, emerging from time to time in his frogman gear. Uh, and this is another shot. And that is the line of the uh, the aqueduct path that some of you may know, uh, which runs from Leebridge Road up uh, towards Copper Mill, is on the line of the old aqueduct. This was, um, as I say, we ca campaigned quite hard. I think we changed the park authority's mind, although it's always one of the things with the pressure group is um, when you do change people's minds, they rarely uh, say, blimey, we were on the wrong track until you put us right. You know, that, that doesn't happen. So the park authority don't acknowledge. Um, I'm trying to think whether that's one of my daughters much younger or not. I, th I think possibly not, but that I, I, I like that shot. I remember thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have open air Shakespeare around on there? Would I still like that? I don't know. This is a rather odd picture. Um, there was a competition and the prize was a flight in a light plane. And I won the competition and I got the flight and I can't remember what the competition was and I can't remember where we took off from or landed, which is irritating. And I took lots of photos out of the window and this was the only one that worked and this shows the uh, Middlesex beds uh, with water on them it shows the the beds which uh, I call the Thames water site which have been filled in um, I don't know whether my cursor shows or not I uh, do that is my cursor visible it is okay that, that there's a very nice Norman Shaw uh, type uh, building on the site called the Red House just near Lee Bridge and that we knew as the White House and I had a meeting with the regional head of Thames Water and I pointed out to him that that would make a lovely building for an interpretation centre and within a week he demolished it so if you say you never uh, get anything change anything as a result of pressure group activities that is a living refutation of that there you go. Can't win them all. Um, that's the uh, uh, that was uh, that building there uh, housed the the Princess Pumping House, uh, which was the 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 um, part of the Leebridge Waterworks. It was in that building that the Civic Trust report was launched in 1964. The Duke of Edinburgh uh, presided over proceedings. He uh, confided that he often overflew the Lee Valley in his helicopter on the way to Sandringham, and he described the Lee Valley memorably 
as a pretty average mess. Uh, that building was um, demolished. Uh, there were attempts to get it listed at the last minute, but Thames Water were, were too fast and took it down. Uh, these are some, some slides uh, which I obviously took on a sunny day um, uh, showing the Leabridge area uh, at, at its best. That's the sluice house overlooking the, the, the weir. That and that and that need no particular ex explanation. Um, not changed very much around there. And then my next slide, uh, I took on the old coal yard car park, uh, which is pretty much the same place as the new car park for the cricket center. Uh, and that was me in my, uh, ain't it all derelict and neglected and forlorn mode, which it was. And to some extent still is. Saturday morning on the marshes is boys morning. And you can see in the background, the four tar blocks of Clapton Park Estate, all named after towns in Derbyshire, of which um, three have now been demolished. I did actually, the job I was doing in the 70s, visit someone in one of those newly built tar blocks who was absolutely delighted. Uh, those tar blocks were, were quite happy places to live in initially, but not for very long. And that's a, another story. That's a classic uh, library shot um, of Hackney Marshes in 1962. Much, much barer than it is now. It's been greened a great deal, particularly on the uh, right hand side, the course of the old River Lee. That is, that is much, much, much more silver now. In the foreground, this is um, Homerton Road, which become, I'm not, can't remember what it's called, going across the marshes. In the foreground, that is Wickfield. Uh, that was flooded in uh, 1995 and subsequently planted, and that is Whit Woodland. So, um, Whit Woodland was inaugurated in 1996, and 25 years or so later, this is what it looks like. Needs managing now, all the trees are the same age, and if you go, you, you will see that. So, um, uh, uh, Tree Musketeers, that wonderful organisation, are managing it uh, to create diversity, and it's a it's an amazing spot, especially when you look at what it was beforehand. That's the old cycling track at uh, Hackney Wick. That was on land which I believe was donated by uh, Hackney Council to, to to the Park Authority. Um, the Park Authority started with a tremendous wave of goodwill, which they've dissipated over the years. Um, I used to go and uh, muck around on there. There's, you have to see a downhill stretch there, and that's crossing the Lead Mill Stream, which is a tiny um, tributary of the Lee, which has entirely disappeared uh, in the redevelopment of the Olympic Games site. And you walk down the lead mill stream. Um, this is what it looked like. Surprisingly, for a rather bucky stream, often used to see a kingfisher down there. And then you, and unfortunately, I took no photos. You always regret it afterwards. You could walk through a tunnel of Japanese knotweed into the Bully Fen Nature Reserve, which was the most bizarrely lost space in the world all of which was um, subsumed in the Olympic site. And, I, and there are probably a few others who are, who are tuned in tonight. When I wander around the um, Olympic site, I superimpose in my mind the palimpsest of the, uh, the site as it once was, although it gets harder with the passage of time. Uh, the Bobat Rivers were, were a rather... Um, uh, uh, neglected overgrown space that picture shows the only feature which is still visible a, a, a bridge over the city mill river 
and that is still there. That's the only thing that hasn't disappeared. And then I'll show again um, the picture I took in, in Stratford in the 80s, showing how bloody awful it had become. And then not to add on, end on too depressing note, there's the, uh, the lovely Three Mills Centre. The Park Authority has had a by no means glorious role in, in the history of this wonderful tidy, tidal mill, but I'll, uh, I'll pass over that. And my last slide, I think, is the East India Dock Basin, which was uh, fell into the Lee Valley Park Authority's hands. It was um, a, a legacy project of the... Um, um, London Docklands Development Corporation and donated to the uh, the park and if you're a bird watcher a place where you can regularly see uh, see teals and shell duck and uh, uh, it's one of my lockdown walks to walk down there and back up the limehouse from where I live in South Hackney it's about a six mile round walk and jolly nice too and if I'm not mistaken that's the last one Good. Any more questions? Excellent, Laurie. Thank you very much. Um, we have a couple more questions coming in while we're setting them up. Um, can I just, um, whilst I'm um, thanking everybody for joining us this evening, just to remind people that the next, the next talk on the 4th of March, Mark Gorman, down with the fences about the popular resistance to the loss of green space in East London in the 19th century. Um, we'll we'll be um, offering you um, a way to book on that this evening, and there'll be a follow up email uh, for those who've registered for the talk for Laurie's talk this evening to um, to give you another chance to book on Mark's talk on the fourth of March. Um, we've I also got want, information. I don't know if you want to see me, but here I am. <laughs> also, we've got information that helps you to either get onto our mailing list where you'll get. Um, You'll get uh, emails we call spacelets, which remind you of upcoming events and uh, amongst other things. Um, also, you can join the Hackney Society for, I think it's a bargain, £15 a year. And you get a quarterly newsletter called Spaces and also um, reductions in the cost of our publications. If you want to get more involved with the Hackney Society, please do get in touch with us. You can contact us on using the um, email Info at hackneysociety.org. Info at hackneysociety.org. And uh, right, Laurie, we've got some more questions Good. to round off. Um, Camilla Allwood asks, what actions do we need to take to protect the Lee Valley from development and maintain or enhance its natural beauty? Well, in theory... The Lee Valley Park is a um, democratically accountable organisation. So you couldn't get in touch with uh, Chris Kennedy, who may be watching our local member. Uh, I think Chris does his best in difficult circumstances and say, we want this, that or the other. And he could tell the park authority and uh, they wouldn't take the blindest bit of notice because they never do. And... Uh, it's run on a business model dictated by the, the Tory members. And, and by the way, there are no Tory boroughs in, in the London stretch of the river. So if you rule that out, um, there have been various organisations I've been part of over the years, but um, Save Lee Marches is a, 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 uh, a body which campaigns for protection of the River Lee and... Uh, if you Google that, you could find how to get in, in touch with them, um, with us. Um, there are rather, there's a, a user group for Hackney Marshes and another user group for Millfields and another user group for Spring, uh, Springfield. Um, and you can volunteer with the London Wildlife Trust if you want to get involved in, in the wetlands. I think those are the best suggestions um, that I can make, yeah. Okay, Laurie, and um, Karina Townsend has a request. Um, can you give a shout out to Cody Dock, the Gasworks Docks Partnership, who are doing an incredible job in keeping access to the tidal lee possible? 
this is an invaluable key to opening up the line. Yes, yes, yes. Glad to do so. The walk to um, uh, down the lee, if you're minded to do it, you walk down the towpath, past three mills, and then up a new ramp onto a road bridge. And then you carry on uh, down the new path um, uh, by the river, passing the horrible Amazon warehouse. And then you go through Cody Dock, where the lovely Nadia will, will serve you a cup of tea from her, her tea stall. And then you make your way through the um, um, uh, squalor of Canning Town until you eventually get, get to the river. So great trip. Uh, the Cody Dock is a essential link in that. And uh, the Cody Dock is, is a wonderful project and all sorts of uh, interesting things go on there. Yes, so very glad to do that. Okay, thanks, Laurie. And I have a quick question. Um, if you were to take your bicycle and say you, you were quite near the Lee Bridge Road, under current circumstances where we have rules about how far we can go for exercise, take your bicycle and cycle the prime ministerial length of seven miles, where would that take you uh, up the Lee Valley and would it be a good place to visit? I was thinking about seven miles because I took a bike ride uh, into uh, the lower part of Epping Forest yesterday. And my my ride, I think at my furthest point, I was five miles from home, I, I think. So, uh, mind you, the women in Derby were five miles from home and they got fined 200 pounds. But I did get there under my own steam and I'm not sure how Boris got to the Olympic Park. But answering the question, seven miles would take you to the edge of London. It would take you... Probably to Enfield Lock. So at seven miles, you'd just be starting to get into the best bit in terms of scenery. Uh, extend that to 10 and you're up in Chesant and Fisher's Green. So, um, um, and uh, uh, I don't think any of us are very keen on going on trains at the moment, but in better times, no matter how far you go up on the, the Lee on your bike, uh, you can hop on a railway station on the Hartford East Line or indeed up the Stort on the on the Bishop Stortford line and get a train back again. Highly recommended. Okay, thanks, Laurie. Um, I'm just going to check with Nick that we haven't just got a, 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 a late coming question, um, but I think we're at the end. Let me just check with Nick. Yeah, it's fine. You have answered all of the questions that people have put. So okay. can I say thank you very much, Laurie Elks, for your talk this evening. It's good to have a talk which is full of um, full of facts and detail, but but seasoned with a bit of opinion and um, born out from long experience. I think a seasoned talk opinions, from a seasoned campaigner. Plenty. Sorry, Laurie. If you want opinions, I've got plenty. Too many sometimes. Now a bit of seasoning it always goes down well. I find. Yeah. So thanks very much, Laurie. Thanks very much for an entertaining evening's talk and virtual visit to the Lee Valley. Um, and if you, um, if you cup your ears, um, you can probably hear the deafening sound of applause <laughs> in the distance. Um, thank you to everybody on the call for coming. Um, please follow up with uh, joining our mailing list and signing up for the next, uh, the next event on the 4th of March. Uh, thanks to all and good night. And thanks once again to Laurie and to Nick in the background. Thanks very much. Good night.